Hello, everyone, and, and welcome to the second day of the Lake Champlain Basin Program's State of the Lake Report release. Today, we are taking a deeper dive into the clean water and healthy ecosystems sections of the new State of the Lake Report that we issued yesterday. Please be aware that this webinar is being recorded today and will be available uh, for viewing from the Basin Program's website. And the new report is also currently available for download from the Basin Program's website, and hard copies will be available late next month. Ryan, can you drop a link into the chat uh, for folks to access the report and also a link into the chat for uh, the, the sign up for folks to use to receive hard copies um, so that we can, we can, uh, you can include your address and your, name, your contact information and, and uh, indicate the number of hard copies that you would like when they're available and we'll get them to you one way or, or another. A French translated version of the report also will be available on the website next month. Uh, so for today's agenda, Dr. Matthew Vaughn will dive into some of the key messages from the clean water section of the report, and then Meg Moldy Gilbertson will review key messages from the healthy ecosystem section. We'll have an opportunity for questions and answers following each presentation, and then uh, after, and then we'll open up the floor to questions about other elements of the report after questions and answers from the healthy ecosystems section has wrapped up. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Matt, um, you want to take it away? Sure, thank you, Eric. And uh, can you just confirm that you're seeing the presentation here okay? Yes, I okay, am. Great. Yep. All right, thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for your interest in Lake Champlain and in the State of the Lake Report. So I will start here with an overview of the clean water section. So overall, uh, Lake Champlain has good water quality and meets the goals of the US Clean Water Act with drinkable, swimmable, and fishable waters. No present water quality challenges have significantly degraded the quality of drinking water sourced in the lake. But still, cyanobacteria blooms impact recreation in some areas of the lake during the summer months, especially when warm weather persists. Lakewide, chloride levels are increasing due to the application of winter road de-icing salt throughout the watershed, but levels still remain well below the point of impacting drinking water quality. And municipalities are upgrading combined sewer systems to reduce the occurrence of overflows, which can send pathogens from untreated waste into the lake. So next here, I want to go over the three goals of the Clean Water Act in a bit more detail. First, Lake Champlain is a safe and reliable source of drinking water to approximately 145,000 people, about a quarter of the basin's population. And all public water utilities are required to monitor for 86 potential contaminants in drinking water and water from Lake Champlain rarely exceeds limits for any of these contaminants. And next, Lake Champlain fish can be safely enjoyed as part of a healthy diet when consumption advisories are followed. Fishing is an important way that people connect with the lake's ecosystem. In New York, Vermont, and Quebec each have determined safe fish consumption levels for, juris for their jurisdictions uh, to provide guidance to anglers. And most fish consumption advisories are due to the presence in fish tissue of mercury a toxic metal that can cause severe illness. So we recommend that all anglers check and understand consumption advisories before enjoying fish, including those from Lake Champlain. And finally here, Lake Champlain basins, rivers and lakes are safe for swimming at most times. For most of the swimming season and in most places, beaches on Lake Champlain are safe and open to the public. And when a beach is closed for health concerns, it's usually a result of a cyanobacteria bloom or due to elevated levels of coliform bacteria. And in this version of the State of the Lake Report, we have improved our interpretation of public beach status data, which we hope will explain the frequency and reason for closures at several popular Lake Champlain beaches. So in the report, the beach um, public beach status graphic is shown in two parts, but here I'm going to break it up into two pieces to explain. So this graph shows daily beach status reports for 17 reporting public beaches on the lake uh, over the 2018 to 2020 time period. When you look at a single day, you're seeing how many beaches were open or closed on that date for three years combined. So for example, all of these beaches were open on June 1st for all three years. That's why you're seeing the blue over June 1st here. However, on August 1st, um, there were 47 uh, open beach days on this date. That's why you're seeing the blue up top here. And there were four closure days over the three-year time period. Three for cyanobacteria blooms, shown in green, 
and one for elevated coliform bacteria levels shown in uh, mustard yellow here. So when considered together, the beaches included here were open for swimming about 97% of the time from Memorial Day to Labor Day um, over the 2018 to 2020 time period. Salobacteria blooms cause closures about 2% of these days and coliform bacteria cause closures less than 1% of these days. Now note again that, these, that this includes 17 beaches where data was available out of 54 public beaches on the lake. And the next part of this graphic dives a bit deeper into the same beach status data and gives you information on all of the 17 reporting beaches, again, from Memorial Day to Labor Day in 2018 to 2020. Here you can see when beaches were uh, open during the three-year time period, when they were closed, and why. So beaches are shown horizontally by row, and different years are shown vertically uh, by column. And again, the status is shown by color, blue for open, uh, green for cyanobacteria closures, and the mustard yellow for coliform bacteria closures. So for example, you can see that Charlotte Town Beach number five here was open every day during this three-year time period, while St. Albans Bay Park at the bottom here was um, the most impacted beach and was open about 88% of this time. Uh, and the closures were due to cyanobacteria blooms. A map alongside the figure orients you so you can see where these beaches are located on the lake. So we hope this new interpretation will provide context for lake users. The take home message here is that our beaches are often open, but challenges remain and vary from place to place. So next I'm gonna to transition to talking a bit more about cyanobacteria, which is also called blue-green algae specifically. Several species of cyanobacteria are found in Lake Champlain and most of the time they do not cause harm. Cyanobacteria can become harmful when their growth is accelerated by calm, warm weather and uh, excessive levels of nutrients such as phosphorus. And a cyanobacteria bloom occurs when colonies of cyanobacteria become large enough to see with the naked eye and form a surface scum like you see in this aerial photo. Cyanobacteria blooms can sometimes produce toxins that can be harmful if ingested by humans, pets, or wildlife. And cyanobacteria blooms can have uh, other adverse effects in Lake Champlain, such as reduced oxygen levels in the water and noxious odors. The Lake Champlain Basin Program works with the Lake Champlain Committee and Vermont and New York State partners to support the Lake Champlain Cyanobacteria Monitoring Program. Uh, during the warm months, more than 100 community scientist volunteers report each week on water conditions along the lake's shoreline. We use this data dating back to 2013 to compile a record of cyanobacteria conditions for the lake as a whole and for each lake segment specifically. So again, this is shown in two parts in the report. I'm gonna break it up here into separate pieces to explain. So here you're seeing a summary of approximately 9,500 reports from trained observers of water quality dating back to 2013. Years are shown horizontally again, and the share of alert level um, for each year is shown in color vertically. Blue for generally safe, clear conditions, yellow for uh, low alert conditions where cyanobacteria is visible but not at bloom levels, and red is shown for high alert conditions where cyanobacteria bloom is in progress. The number in the corner represents the average number of reports uh, per year. Note that these are routine reports only, meaning that they were recorded during a regular weekly or bi-weekly interval throughout each season. And the main message of this graph is that most routine visual assessments of water quality on Lake Cham Champlain during the recreational season um, show generally safe conditions that are free of cyanobacteria blooms. You will read in the report that over 95% of these reports submitted since 2013 have reported generally safe conditions during the recreational season. However, as many of you are aware, conditions vary drastically among lake regions. And so this next graphic, or next part of the same graphic, shows the same data, but now broken up by lake segment. Here the graphs are the same as before, where the years are shown horizontally, and the share of routine report levels are shown again with color vertically. Note that the average number of reports per year uh, varies across the lake. You can see here that cyanobacteria blooms are not common in the main lake segment, and you'll read in the report that about 98% of reports from main lake locations since 2013 indicated generally safe conditions. In contrast, cyanobacteria blooms are more common in Missisquoi Bay and St. Albans Bay, for example, where just less than 80% of reports indicated generally safe conditions. 
And because we have limited resources with how often we can be out observing the water, this data is certainly not perfect, but we do think it provides a good representation of our understanding of cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Champlain. And in addition to the Lake Champlain cyanobacteria monitoring program that collected this data, partners in the basin are pushing the envelope to inform our understanding and management of cyanobacteria blooms. So for example, the University of Vermont will use drones to determine the extent of cyanobacteria blooms and satellite images to study the distribution and severity of blooms across the lake. The Lake Champlain Basin Program and our partners are working to address the root cause of cyanobacteria blooms in Lake Champlain by working to limit the levels of nutrients available for their growth. Phosphorus in particular is a key nutrient driving cyanobacteria blooms. And since the beginning of the industrial era, Human activities have rapidly increased the rate of nitrogen and phosphorus delivery to Lake Champlain and to thousands of water bodies around the world with profound effects on freshwater systems almost everywhere. For every square mile on the surface of Lake Champlain, 18 square miles of land in the Lake Champlain Basin deliver water, sediment, nutrients, and other potential pollutants to the lake. For the Great Lakes, this ratio is much lower. There is only about a one and a half to three and a half times as much land as lake surface area in those basins. Most nutrients come from sources on the land, so the relatively high land to lake area ratio for Lake Champlain creates a challenge in limiting nutrient pollution. Because other nutrients are generally plentiful in Lake Champlain, phosphorus is often the nutrient that limits the growth of cyanobacteria. So in order to reduce the occurrence and persistence of cyanobacteria blooms, lake managers have set targeted limits on phosphorus concentrations for each segment of the lake and work to reduce the loading of phosphorus to the lake from tributaries. So this next graphic uh, might look familiar to you if you've seen earlier versions of the State of the Lake Report. Here we show phosphorus data in Lake Champlain from long -term monitoring, the long-term monitoring program. It's a flagship project that the Lake Champlain Basin Program has supported since 1990 in partnership with New York and Vermont Departments of Environmental Conservation. This plot on the left is an enlarged version of what you see on the right. So you can see um, years from 1990 to 2020 shown horizontally, and the annual average phosphor phosphorus concentration for that segment shown vertically. Now, each lake segment has a different water quality goal for phosphorus, which is shown with the horizontal dotted lines and the number of that limit um, shown here in micrograms per liter. Levels are shown in blue if they're below this limit, and red for the portions that are above this limit. And you can see annual levels for all the segments shown next to this uh, map on the right. The main takeaway here is that many lake segments have phosphorus concentrations that are often near or below targeted limits. And that's why you're seeing mostly blue in graphs for the Isle of Lamont segment, Cumberland Bay, Main Lake, Port Henry, Shelburne Bay, Burlington Bay, and Mallets Bay, which together make up about 82% of Lake Champlain's total volume. However, phosphorus concentrations in Lake Champlain's shallow bays, the Northeast Arm, and parts of the South Lake are often above these limits. And that's why you're seeing the red in plots for Missiscoy Bay, St. Albans Bay, and the South Lake A segment. So another main takeaway from this is that from 1990 to 2020, most segments have not shown long-term changes in phosphorus concentration, though we have seen a slightly increasing trend over this time period in the Northeast Arm segment. And if you look closely, you may notice that phosphorus concentrations have been relatively lower in uh, some of these segments in the past few years. That's encouraging. And we're gonna continue to monitor to see if these decreases continue. So now that we've looked at this important data on the lake itself, we're gonna shift our view upstream and into the watershed. And our rivers are pathways for water, sediment, and nutrients to move into Lake Champlain. And each year, the lake's tributaries deliver more than 2 trillion gallons of water and about 921 metric tons, or about 2 million pounds of phosphorus. Similar to the goals we just looked at for in-lake phosphorus concentrations, we also have goals for how much phosphorus should be delivered annually to each lake segment. So these graphs compare measured tributary phosphorus loading to the established water quality goals we have for each segment. And here we're highlighting three of the 13 lake segments, the main lake, Cumberland Bay, and Missisco Bay. You will see years again, starting in 1990 horizontally and a point for each year. So points that fall on each dotted line here um, indicate that measured phosphorus loading was on track with the loading limit for that segment. 
points that are above uh, that dotted line in the red region were above the loading limit for that segment and points in the blue region were below the limit for each segment. So for example, in 1999, phosphorus loading to the main lake was right on track with the limit for that segment. So that's good news. In contrast, in 2011, when the Lake Champlain Basin experienced historic flooding that delivered huge amounts of water and nutrients to the lake, loading was closer to five times greater than the limit for this segment. The lowest phosphorus loading to the main lake segment on record was in 1995, when, the, when rivers delivered approximately 63% of the targeted limit. And there are two main takeaways here. The first is that phosphorus loading to Lake Champlain varies greatly from year to year. Annual phosphorus delivery to Lake Champlain delivers on the, depends on the amount of snow, rain, and runoff in the watershed. And this variability makes reducing phosphorus loading more difficult. So while management practices may help to reduce inputs, the increasingly intense rainstorms associated with climate change May, re may release more phosphorus, possibly canceling out some of the gains made through pollution reduction efforts. And the second main takeaway is that phosphorus loading needs to be reduced overall to consistently meet water quality goals. So this is clear in the third plot you see here from Mississippi Bay, where each year estimated loading is higher than the established limit. Many efforts are underway to reduce phosphorus loading and to ultimately reduce phosphorus concentrations in Lake Champlain. So for the first time uh, in this version of the State of the Lake Report, we have included a graphic that demonstrates the impact of winter road de-icing salts on Lake Champlain chemistry. De-icing salts applied to road surfaces during the winter contain chloride, which is a form of chlorine. Table salt, for example, is sodium chloride. So if you drop table salt in a glass of water, you will increase that water's chloride concentration. And the same thing happens to Lake Champlain when road salt is applied in the winter um, is transported to the lake um, throughout the entire year by snow melt, rain runoff, and by groundwater inputs to rivers and streams. This makes rivers and lakes saltier, a process known as salinization. Human caused, recent human caused salinization of freshwater systems has been found throughout the Lake Champlain region and throughout the world. And negative effects of low and high level salinization can impact all levels of an ecosystem, uh, including primary producers, zooplankton macroinvertebrates, amphibians, and fish communities. So this next graph um, shows chloride concentrations um, in Lake Champlain, again, from long-term monitoring program data collected since 1990. And there are two lines here. The light blue line is for shallower sites grouped together, and the dark blue line is for deeper sites, again, grouped together. Years are shown horizontally, and uh, the points and lines represent the annual average chloride concentration in milligrams per liter. And there are two main takeaways uh, from this graph. First, chloride concentrations in Lake Champlain are changing. We indicated on the graph where trends have reversed from increasingly, or sorry, excuse me, um, from increasing in roughly the first decade of monitoring to decreasing in roughly the second decade, decade of monitoring, and then steadily increasing again during the past decade. And these trends are driven by long-term changes and recent increases in chloride loading from nearly all of Lake Champlain Basin's rivers. For example, the Winooski River alone delivered roughly 20,000 metric tons or 44 million pounds of chloride per year in the early 1990s, but in recent years it delivered approximately twice that amount annually. The second main point here is that although chloride levels are rising recently, they remain well below established benchmark levels for drinking water quality and aquatic life toxicity, which are over 200 milligrams per liter, more than 10 times greater than what we see um, here in Lake Champlain. The Lake Champlain Basin Program partners and public works departments across the basin are taking initiatives to safely reduce winter de-icing salt application and to educate individuals and property manage managers on best de-icing practices. To reduce the impact of Lake Champlain, uh, excuse me, reduce the impact of de-icing salts on Lake Champlain and other water bodies. Uh, reducing the amount of de-icing salt applied in the watershed um, to parking lots and roadways should reduce the amount of chloride we measure in Lake Champlain. So that is what I have time to share today. But if you have specific questions on the graphs I've shown or other graphics in the report, uh, we'd be happy to answer them now. Excellent, thank you, Matt. 
Uh, so those of you who are participants or attendees, you may um, add, type your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your, of your Zoom window. You'll, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of the window, you'll see a, a, a Q&A option pop up. You can type a question into there if you'd like, or you can also use the raise hand feature, um, which also is uh, an option along the, the bottom of the Zoom window. You'll see a yellow hand. And you can just hit that and uh, we can uh, acknowledge you and, and unmute you and you can ask your question that way. All right, we have a question from Mary Jo Feuerbach at EPA Region 1. Um, are there areas in the basin where chloride loadings are much higher than others and should be a focus for reduction? Matt, do you have a response for that? I, I do, yeah. Thanks for that question, Mary Jo. It's, it's a good one. And that's, um, you know, it's one of the approaches we take with other pollutants like phosphorus, where we know the, the levels really differ from, from segment to segment. For chloride, the really remarkable thing is that we're seeing a lake-wide, the lake-wide trends are, are remarkably um, similar. So we're seeing very similar trends in all of our lake segments and similar levels even. So that's an indication that chloride is, is relatively well mixed throughout um, Lake Champlain in, in its entirety. Um, what we do see is differences in chloride loading from our rivers. So that will be an indication for where um, reduction efforts could be focused. Um, so we have those ana ana analyses in hand. It didn't make into the state of lake report as kind of a high level takeaway. Um, so we know that, for example, application of road salt is very, very high in the Adirondacks on the highways and, and road, um, on New York highways. And we know that, um, like I said, the Winooski River, the largest tributary to Lake Champlain, uh, has had remarkable increases in chloride um, loading. So those are two examples of areas where we could focus efforts. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Uh, several more questions on chloride. Uh, we have one related to the methodology, there's an interest in the methodology for measuring chloride, and then also a question about the, the upward trend in chloride corresponding to increased use of salt brine. Sure. Um, so the methodology um, has been the same since the beginning of the program, I believe, the long-term monitoring program since 1990. We have just updated the, the method um, so that could be accredited in a, in a few different ways, but this is um, a standard method, EPA approved methods um, done by the Vermont State Agricultural um, Lab, VAL is, is the acronym. So Vermont Agricultural Environmental Laboratory, I think that's what it stands for. Um, so these, this has been um, EPA approved methods. Um, I believe it's a latchet method uh, up until recently, uh, if you want to know the want to know the uh, EPA method number, I'd be happy to share that with you. Um, I hope that answers your question. On that. I don't have that one methodized or memorized, although I should, I, I was writing about it yesterday, but I'd be happy to share if you'd like more detail on that specific method. I think that answers your question. Um, and what was the other one, Eric, about salt brine? Yeah, do you, uh, is the upward trend in chloride, uh, does that potentially correspond to increased use of salt brine? Oh, um, so I, I we, we don't know. Um, we don't have excellent data on salt application and, re, and relating that to what we're seeing in the lake. Although the use of salt brine um, actually reduces the amount of chloride applied to road surfaces. So that's actually one of the management practices that is um, helpful in reducing chloride. You can use, I think the number, it's a, it's a fraction of the amount of salt in a brine. Uh, because this, the brine adheres to the full road surface rather than having individual grains that need to make contact and melt uh, more of the, uh, the surface area of the road. Um, so Lake Champlain Basin Program has supported the use of, of brining and we're actually um, in partnership with Washington County in the coming year to, um, help to purchase a salt brine maker um, for Washington County road services. Um, I'm not sure if we have anyone from Lake Champlain Sea Grant on Eric, but they, they're um, 
a partner of the, the Basin program, and they've done a lot of work in this space. So I'm curious if they, uh, if Chris or Breck have anything to add if they're on. Yeah, I don't see Chris. Okay. Um, I don't see Breck, Breck on either. Okay, that's fine. Maybe if there's somebody else from Secret that I'm missing, there's 60 participants, so I'm scanning very quickly. You can raise your hand. Sure. Uh, okay, uh, one more question on chloride from Andrew Milliken, and then we'll get to the one on, on phosphorus. Um, so Andrew's asking if the increase in chloride relates to the increase in roads and for resurfaces or any other changes in practices. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Andrew, and um, it's one that um, it, it tracks. It, you could say it's presumably true, but it hasn't been studied specifically to my knowledge. We know that impervious surfaces are have increased in several areas of the, of the basin. And of course, um, winter road maintenance would require um, application of de-icing salts on those surfaces. Um, again, that's not something that's been uh, studied directly, but we do, it's, it's, it's difficult because we have all this long-term monitoring program data and we're seeing trends, but we don't always have the resources to study the why, especially for something like chloride, um, which is, you know, it's, we're, we're starting to highlight it now. Um, and like I said, our, our partners have done a lot of work in this space, but it is something that I think deserves a bit more attention in, in the coming years. And, and I also mentioned that public works departments are doing a lot of work to try to reduce the application of DSing salts using things like brine or, or making sure their equipment's functioning properly so that when there is an increased amount of impervious surface, they have to maintain they're hopefully using less salt per surface area. All right, thanks, Matt. And one more question in the, in the Q&A feature here uh, from Michelle Monroe. It, she says that it, it appears from the charts that phosphorus is increasing in Mounts Bay. Can you comment on the causes? Okay, good, good question. Um, so I can go back to that graph. So we, there were a few years, um, it's kind of hard to see in this version, but if you look at the report, you can really zoom in here. Um, and for each of these segments, we did a statistical analysis to determine whether there are, we call them statistically significant increases or decreases in phosphorus concentration. And what you're not seeing in this graph is that is the annual variability around these lines. Um, these are averages, of course. So there's every, every time uh, the program goes out to measure, it might be above or below this line, and we kind of average out those lines. For the main takeaways here. So overall for Mallets Bay and for nearly every lake segment, there's actually no long-term significant trend in the phosphorus concentrations. So that includes Mallets Bay, but you are seeing um, re a few recent years where the phosphorus concentration was a bit, the average concentration was a bit higher than the limit. So that is true. But in the past several years, or I guess handful of years, it's been right at about that limit. So um, there, there is no significant trend uh, in that segment. Um, and uh, again, this is another area where it's really difficult when we do see an increase, or we do see high concentrations in some areas, it's difficult to pinpoint exactly why, but we do understand um, that phosphorus comes from nearly all segments of the Lake Champlain Basin, from agricultural sources, from developed lands, um, from, from wetlands and stream bank erosions, from wastewater treatment facilities, and that's why uh, managers for Lake Champlain really focus on the all-in approach and, and trying to reduce phosphorus loading from every, every source where possible. Thanks, Matt. And, and Colleen just had a good comment. Matt, can you, with your cursor, just circle or highlight the, the figure for Mallets Bay or the chart for Mallets Bay to make sure I was looking at the right? To, to highlight where Mallets Bay is? The, yeah, so that's the, well, where Mallets Bay is, but the, also the, the graph for Mallets Bay. Oh, sure, sure. It can be with the headers in this, this Zoom format it can be kind of confusing to figure out. Gotcha. Sorry. Okay. Yep. So Mallet's Bay is here. And yeah, these these leader lines are a little faint, but the, the actual lake segment is here. So it's the arrow follows to there. Yep. All right. Thank you, Matt. Oh, I can I can mention one more thing since there's interest in Mallet's Bay. Um, we're the long-term monitoring program. I described a little bit about the methodology that's been the, mostly the same since 1990, and that makes it really valuable. Um, and we're gonna keep moving forward with that methodology, but um, we're also gonna be adding some um, two buoys to our network so that it will measure water quality and weather uh, parameters in real time um, about every 15 minutes. So you'll be, hopefully by the end of the summer and certainly by next year, you'll be able to go online and see what the water quality is like 
in Mallets Bay and in the Lamoille River that drains to Mallets Bay. Um, so that's an exciting improvement we're we're working on. Yeah, that's a that's a, um, an awesome upgrade um, for, for the monitoring program. It's awesome new information for, for, for future reports. Um, okay, so it's ten thirty, and I'd like to, to switch it over to to Meg, and so she can share some highlights from the healthy ecosystem section. If there uh, are, if any of you do still have questions for Matt on the clean water section, we'll have an opportunity at the end of the program this morning to, to go back to that and, and any other uh, questions about the report or whatever you like. Okay. Meg, you need to unmute your microphone. Looks like your screen share is working. All right. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, take it away. Right. Thank you, great. Um, just gonna move one more thing. There we go, great. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm excited to share an overview of the healthy ecosystem section of the report and highlight a few graphics. The Lake Champlain Basin is made up of a diversity of rich habitats such as forested wetlands and floodplains that provide ecosystem services such as nutrient cycling, sediment absorption, and water and air purification. And it supports thousands of species when they're intact and functioning. 40% of the basin is conserved, which protects it from development and exploitation. The basin is home to 70 rare, threatened, and endangered species, including the spiny softshell turtle, which you see here, mud puppy, the lake sturgeon, Indiana bat, and common tern. And with protection efforts, some species are recovering, such as the bald eagle and the common loon. The greatest threat to habitat and species diversity includes fragmentation, climate change, human pressures, and aquatic invasive species. Lake Champlain's fish continue to be enjoyed by anglers and more research is underway to better understand the status of fish populations. The report highlights a great fish success story by 1900, there were not enough lake trout in, in Lake Champlain to sustain this, the population. University of, of Vermont biologists have recently found multiple age classes of wild lake trout in Lake Champlain. And the, for the first time, we're gonna reduce stocking by 33% in 2022. This will help to maintain a healthy balance between wild and stocked lake trout and the forage fish base. Some highlights from the healthy ecosystem section of the State of the Lake report include a look at landlocked Atlantic salmon historic habitat access, information about climate change and lake service freezeover, the status of new aquatic invasive species in Lake Champlain, non-native threats to the basin from connected waterways and watercraft inspection and decontamination data. We'll also review the status of sea lamprey wounding rates on landlocked Atlantic salmon and lake trout and the invasive water chestnut management program. Landlocked Atlantic salmon access to historic, ha historic habitat in Lake Champlain's tributaries is, is a new map featured in the report. Increased access to spawning habitat supports the species stability in the lake. Figure 11 shows that Atlantic salmon have good access to most historic tributary habitat. The waterfall icon illustrates the first natural barrier on the tributaries to Lake Champlain. And downstream, of those icons is where historic habitat exists. While more work is needed to restore access on the Saranac and Missisquoi rivers, access is good and many groups are focusing on assessing dams for removal and replacing culverts for improved passage for all aquatic organisms. The map highlights partnership efforts to conduct a trap and truck program where biologists collect and transfer salmon above the dams where, where they are then released to allow greater access to suitable but not historic habitat on the Winooski River. We look forward to tracking improved access over time. Climate change impacts to the basin are illustrated in a number of ways in our 2021 report. Air temperatures are increasing. The average daily minimum temperature during winter months is increasing and the average daily maximum temperature during summer months is also increasing. Lake Champlain lake surface freezeover is tracked each year. In figure 13, you can see that in the 1900s, the lake surface froze over nearly every year in the first half of the century. In the second half of the century, it froze over much less frequently. 
Currently, the lake freezes over once every four years. We have added this probability of Lake Champlain surface freeze over analysis to the report, which predicts that by 2050, the lake may freeze just once per decade. When the lake does not freeze over, it may experience increased warming and decreased mixing, which creates conditions favorable for invasive aquatic plant growth and cyanobacteria blooms. Recently, the Lake Champlain Basin Program partnered with the Community Sailing Center to support the design of aquatic invasive species themed sail. This beautiful black and white artwork was created by local artist Nikki Lazar and depicts some of the invasive species present in Lake Champlain. The sail will be featured on the waterfront for the next few years. It's important to define what aquatic invasive species are. They can be plants, animals, or pathogens that are not native to this region and cause harm to the environment, the economy, or human health. Aquatic invasive species are negatively impacting the food web in the lake and the fishery. Zebra mussels filter huge amounts of plankton, making them unavailable for other species consumption. They also cut the feet of swimmers, clog water intake pipes, and encrust historic shipwrecks. Invasive alewife are displacing the native smelt population and are interfering with lake trout and salmon reproduction. Eurasian water milfoil outcompetes native plants, choke shorelines, and impacts waterfront property values and make it difficult to swim, fish, or boat through their dense beds. Figure 15 shows the year of first detection of both aquatic non-native and invasive species. Along the x-axis, excuse me, the horizontal line and their cumulative number um, in Lake Champlain on the vertical line. Lake Champlain is home to 51 known, non-native and invasive aquatic species. Just over a dozen in the lake have been documented to cause some type of harm and are considered invasive. Those species include water chestnut, Eurasian water milfoil, zebra mussels and alewife. Some non-native species that may become invasive include the tench, a fish that spread throughout the lake and are growing in number and size. If tench are determined to cause harm, they would then become invasive and switch from the light green color to the dark green color on the graph. The majority of non-native species in Lake Champlain have not been measured to cause harm. Some non-native species such as rainbow trout and largemouth bass were intentionally introduced by humans for our enjoyment. Most recent invasive, the most recent invasive species detected in Lake Champlain was the fishhook water flea in 2018. The fishhook water flea is an invasive crustacean. Like the spiny water flea, which is the larger organism on the right-hand side photograph, um, which was discovered in Lake Champlain in 2014, the smaller fishhook water flea is a voracious predator as well. It's impacted the lake's phytoplankton community and now is outcompeting the spiny water flea. The fishhook is native to Northern Europe and Asia and was likely introduced through ballast water in the Great Lakes and then hitched a ride to Lake Champlain on boats, trailers, or other types of fishing equipment. The species small size and resting egg life stage can go unnoticed in bilge motor and bait bucket water when thousands of, species, of the species barbed tail gets hooked onto and, onto and fouls fishing line, they are very hard to miss. Lake sto stewards that operate watercraft inspection stations around Lake Champlain help to remove and decontaminate fouled fishing line, as you can see in the picture on the left. While Lake Champlain is home to 51 known non-native and invasive species, connected waterways contain greater numbers of threats to our lake. Most of the harmful invasive species are introduced to the Great Lakes from freshwater ballast from foreign ports, and the rate of introduction to the Great Lakes has slowed in the past few decades. Once in the Great Lakes, invasive species are able to move across watersheds, primarily through canalways and overland by hitchhiking a ride with on boats, trailers, and other recreational equipment. Once in Lake Champlain, invasive species are costly and difficult to control and contain. Effort is put into managing the primary pathways by which they can reach us. Lake Champlain is connected to the St. Lawrence Seaway to the north through the Chambly Canal. It's also connected to the Hudson and the Great Lakes by the Champlain Canal to our south. The Army Corps of Engineers is working on assessing barriers to prevent the inner basin transfer of aquatic invasive species in the Champlain Canal. Watercraft inspection and decontamination programs in the Adirondacks on Lake Champlain in Quebec and Vermont are growing to cover more launch sites with more resources. 
Once invasive species become established in a body of water, again, it's difficult to contain and control. Spread prevention and education and outreach programs are the most cost-effective way to manage these species. Figure 18 is a summary of the Lake Champlain steward data that shows the most common water bodies with aquatic invasive species that were visited by boaters prior to launching in Lake Champlain. For example, we know that there are invasive species present in the St. Lawrence, Hudson, and Connecticut rivers that are not yet present in Lake Champlain. Species like hydrilla and round goby, as well as the quagga mussel are getting closer to the watershed's doorstep. Early detection and rapid response efforts to new detections are critical and depend on citizen science programs and agency preparedness. Luckily, the Lake Champlain Basin has an aquatic invasive species rapid response task force ready to respond to new infestations. Boat launch stewards on Lake Champlain are trained to inspect boats and trailers and look for aquatic plants, mud on anchors and ropes, and water remaining in bilge motors and live wells. They operate high pressure, hot water decontamination units to spray off, flush out, and kill aquatic organisms from high risk watercraft. In the past few years, stewards have intercepted hydrilla and quagga mussels off of watercraft launching into Lake Champlain and most commonly remove zebra mussels, Eurasian water milfoil, and fish hook and spiny water fleas from watercraft headed to uninvaded waters in the region. The great news is that 75% of the lakes in the Adirondacks and 80% of the lakes in, in Vermont are free of aquatic invasive species. Another popular topic to cover in the State of the Lake report is sea lamprey wounding rate. Sea lamprey are a parasitic eel-like fish that feed on Atlantic salmon, lake trout, and other sport fish in Lake Champlain. Management approaches for sea lamprey primarily target larval and spawning life stages when they are in the rivers. Sea lamprey wounding on Atlantic salmon and lake trout is tracked over time and, and is reported as a lake-wide healthy ecosystems indicator in the 2021 report. Sea lamprey wounding rate on lake trout fluctuate and recently have been well above the goal of 25 wounds per 100 fish. On the left-hand chart, you can see that target wounding rate of 25 for lake trout and the target rate of 15 um, per 100 Atlantic salmon. Wounding rates on Atlantic salmon are much often closer to that target of 15 wounds per 100 fish. While wounding rates for each spe species are varied, they have been decreasing over time since the implementation of the routine program for management in 2003. The water chestnut is an invasive annual plant that forms dense leafy mats that float on the water's surface. In the southern end of Lake Champlain, water chestnut limits boat traffic and recreational use, crowds out native species and creates areas with oxygen levels that are so low that those areas are uninhabitable to fish and other organisms. Water chestnut management continues to be successful at reducing the percentage of lake area covered by this invasive plant, especially at the southern end of Lake Champlain. Populations in the South Lake are managed with mechanical and hand harvesting techniques. Smaller isolated populations of this invasive plant have been found by lake users at a few sites in northern sections of the lake where hand harvesting efforts are successful and effective. There are many steps we can take to help protect the basin's habitat and species. We can plant riparian buffers and native species in our gardens. We can conserve land, never release pets or aquarium plants into the wild, dispose of fishing bait properly, use local firewood to prevent the spread of forest pests and clean, drain and dry our boats and equipment to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species. Lake Champlain is a very special place to all of us and we have a responsibility to steward its lands and rivers. I hope you'll get a chance to go outside and enjoy the watershed and the lake today. So that's all the time that I have to cover the healthy ecosystem section of the report and we can open it up to questions. All right, thank you, Meg. And uh, Meg, can you turn on your camera and give the crowd a wave? Oh, there we go, excellent. Um, okay, so uh, same approach as before. If you have a question, you can feel free to use the Q and A feature here in, in Zoom or uh, raise your hand and we can we'll acknowledge you and, and, and unmute you. And I see uh, Mary Jo has let off again. Nice job, Mary Jo, with a question. Um, so Mary Jo says, uh, as climate change results in changes to water temperatures and habitat, 
do you think that the Lake Champlain science community should consider changing their thinking on what species considered, which species are considered to be non-native as species migrate to find new appropriate habitat to survive? Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary Jo. That's a great question. Um, most of the aquatic invasive species that we are concerned about um, in terms of there's two differences here. One's range expansion. So some aquatic plants that might exist more um, naturally, let's say along the mid-Atlantic coast, um, if they were to move north uh, into the Lake Champlain basin um, naturally, that would be considered sort of a range expansion. And I think we would view those organisms as possibly native nuisance species that were just expanding their range. Um, but the invasive species, we are specific that they're not native to this region, meaning that they're usually crossing watershed boundaries and sometimes continent boundaries, um, continental boundaries by um, human activities. So whether that's in ballast water, overlands on boats, on trailers, we purchase something off the internet and plant it in our water garden and it escapes. So that's the difference I think that we draw between uh, native expansion um, and non-native and invasive species. All right, thank you, Meg. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Well, folks are thinking, Meg, Meg can you, what do you think about um, water chestnut management and um, mechanical harvesting? Will we ever get, get to the point where we don't need to invest in mechanical harvesting anymore? It's a great question, Eric. That's the goal. Um, we are looking at long-term management of water chestnut in Lake Champlain. We've been at it for decades. There's been quite a group of partners from the state of Vermont, the state of New York, um, we even have Quebec partners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Army Corps of Engineers involved in helping to pay for and support with staff time and efforts and equipment in removing water chestnut from Lake Champlain. In the southern end of the lake, we have the densest um, mats of water chestnut that we are removing mechanically. Um, when the population is greater than 25% surface cover on the lake, that's when it makes sense where the water is deep enough to mechanically harvest those spoils and offload them to a composting site on land. Um, but when we have uh, smaller populations that are more spread out or in shallower waters, we use kayaks and canoes to get in and hand harvest them. If we're able to maintain our efforts at managing the mechanical harvesting in the South Lake, we hope that in another decade's time, we might be able to um, stop the mechanical harvesting and switch over to just hand harvesting. Um, the challenge there is that the water chestnut, chestnut nutlets, when they fall to the lake bed, may be viable in the sediment for up to 10 years, sometimes up to 13 years. So we need to be vigilant and continue to harvest these plants, um, but we are pushing the population further and further south in Lake Champlain. Excellent, thank you, Meg. Um, and we do have a, we did we did have a few more uh, questions and comments pop up in the Q and A form here. Uh, Mario Paula from EPA Region Two asked uh, Meg if you can briefly discuss the Vessel Incident Discharge Act effort with the Great Lakes. We have a couple more questions as well. Thanks, Mario. Yeah, so the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act passed in December of 2018, and it created um, the Great Lakes and Lake Champlain Invasive Species Program. Uh, that program is authorized at $50 million annually. It has been appropriated $0 to date, but the partners within Great Lakes EPA and Great Lake and uh, EPA Regions 1 and 2 in the Basin Program have been collaborating over the last few years to share our knowledge, to learn from each other. And currently underway, we are um, supporting with Lake Champlain Sea Grant, a graduate student to populate the Lake Champlain component of the Great Lakes Invasive Species Information System, um, which will document when uh, uh, non-native and invasive species were first detected, what kinds of impacts they have, and it can help to generate risk assessments that were developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as create uh, watch lists for species that we should be the most concerned about causing harm uh, to our environment. And we likely will have a lot of overlap with organisms in the Great Lakes, but that's a piece that we have been missing in Lake Champlain. So we're really excited about that initiative. All right, thank you, Meg. Um, we have a question about the state of the common fish, bullhead, and northern pike, um, and, and others. 
And, and I'll, I'll just briefly respond to that. This is something that the basin program does not track uh, that closely. We work closely with our, our fisheries managers partners, uh, both with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and with uh, Vermont DEC and New York Fish and Wildlife Department, and, and also colleagues up in Quebec as well. Um, Meg, if you have something you'd like to share, go ahead. Otherwise, I might um, pull in Andrew Milliken from US Fish and Wildlife Service or Margaret Mur Murphy from Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. Let's pull them in. <laughs> Ryan, can you promote um, Andrew and, and Margaret if, if, if they're able to, to provide some thoughts on that? Uh, hi, this is Andrew. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, Andrew. For the species that were referenced, I would actually uh, make makes more sense for Margaret to answer that question. Those are species that are typically managed by the state agencies. Okay, and I see Margaret is on. Margaret, you have anything? I am on, thank you. Um, yes, we do, we've done some Northern Pike surveys. We actually were out this spring doing some in the South Lake, um, which is where um, a lot of the, the Northern Pike spawn, and we had a survey done in the Northern part of the lake as well. I don't have results of that, but it is a species we're monitoring. As to bullhead, they get incorporated as we're out sampling for Northern Pike. We do a full fish community assessment. I, again, we try to do that on a rotating basis um, every few years, so it's not an annual uh, monitoring. But from, from initial reports, I think both of those species, both northern pike and bullhead, are um, healthy populations, and we're not concerned about them at this point. Well, thank you, Margaret and, and Andrew, for the, uh, the, on, uh, the phone a friend tool we use here. Um, we also have a, a question back back to Meg. Uh, we have a question um, from I, I imagine this is Elizabeth Lee from the Maritime Museum. Uh, can you can she ask if you can talk more about the status of the potential hydrological separation of the canals? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, really, for three decades now, there have been interest um, in looking at the inner basin transfer of aquatic invasive species between the Hudson and the Champlain drainages. And of course, we are connected to the Great Lakes through the Erie Canal as well. Um, so we've initiated partnerships with the New York State Canal Corporation, um, then the Thruway Authority, now the New York State Power Authority, um, Sea Grants, uh, the state agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and we have been working to look at um, hydrologic separation on the Champlain Canal. So the Army Corps of Engineers is working on three different alternative designs right now, uh, which would uh, either be implemented at Lock 9 or just south of Lock 9 um, to help recreational traffic continue to move through the system, um, but would prevent aquatic organisms from moving through the system. So if you ask what that might look like, some options include a berm, which would separate physically the two watersheds at the height of the Champlain Canal, um, where boats would be lifted up and over, traveling both north and southbound and be sprayed down and decontaminated um, upon that transit, um, or installing certain types of boat lifts at Lock 9, um, where boats similarly would be lifted and sprayed down and put in on the other side to prevent that uh, spread of invasive species between the two basins. Recently, our efforts have been complemented by Governor Cuomo's efforts for Reimagine the Canal um, in, the New York, in New York State, where there are additional efforts and resources looking at flood, um, flood mitigation, enhancing local communities along the Erie Canal, and addressing aquatic invasive species transfer, because there are great concerns about organisms such as hydrilla, the snakehead, and Asian carp. Um, in moving through through that Erie Canal system. Thank you, Meg. Um, I don't see any other questions in the Q and A. Um, I, and I don't see any raised hands. If uh, folks, you know, we can at this point we can open up to anything general or general anything, any of the other section questions in the other sections of the report as well, or or other other general questions about the lake. Please feel free to go ahead and, and ask. Um, Lori Fisher, Meg Lori Fisher just, just uh, added a question. Um, and she's asking for, for Lori from the Lake Champlain Committee, uh, is asking if you can provide more details on the time frame for implementation on the canal. 
Um, I can let you know when this first, the report for the alternative analysis is supposed to be available in the next six months. Um, once an alternative is recommended, it needs to be vetted um, with all of the partners. Um, we need to obtain some buy-in and then a full design would have to be conducted. Um, and that would likely take a few years before that full design of a selected alternative could be uh, ready to go. Thanks, Meg. Does anyone else have any questions they like they would like to ask? Again, you can use the, the question and answer feature, um, or you can raise your hand and we can we can unmute you. All right, going once, twice, last chance. All right, all right. Well, um, that will wrap up our virtual presentations for the new state of the lake report. Um, again, if you are you or your group are interested in, in additional presentations, uh, please connect with our office to, to schedule a presentation. We'd be happy to, to find a time that works for you and your group. Um, I'd like to thank all of the, the basement program staff again for your hard work and dedication in producing this report and um, the steering committee members and, and members of our advisory committees and additional colleagues uh, who provided the, the critical data to inform this report and, and help with the interpretation. And again, thank you uh, very much for all of your time and, and your interest in Lake Champlain. And, and um, finally, the, again, the report is available for download on the basement program's website and our copies will be available next month. Thank you all for, for, for your time and, and have a great day.